My name is Tony Ware. I'm the uh, department head for the Department of Mathematics and Statistics in the Faculty of Science. And I'm very pleased uh, that you're able to join us today, both in person and online. Um, this is a, a, a lecture series that we've enjoyed over the years very much. It was originally a birthday gift um, from uh, Louise to Richard, but really it was a gift to us all. Um, Richard was passionate about sharing his love of mathematics with others. And uh, over the years in this uh, series, we've had the privilege of, wel of welcoming speakers who've embodied that same passion in many different ways. We've had talks on poetry and drumming, on uh, juggling, art, billiards, and much more. We've even had a piano up on stage, but uh, uh, thankfully uh, not today. Um, anyway, but um, there are a couple of housekeeping notes that we do need to, to uh, be aware of. Um, so. Um, for those of you who are joining us in person, it will be useful to know that the washrooms are located uh, basically out in the corridors, um, just outside the room here. Um, if we're asked to evacuate the building, uh, the quickest way out of the building is to go out the doors and head left. And um, at that point to follow, I believe, Melody, who's sitting in the corner here. So, so she'll have to make some you know wait for her to make her way out and then follow her to the uh, muster point one we'll be able to resume the lecture once we're allowed back into the building uh, we are recording today's session and uh, we'll be posting the video on the pims uh, math tube channel um so uh, without further ado i would like to um, introduce uh, nancy chibri who is the Associate Dean in the Faculty of Science for Undergraduate Programs and Student Affairs. Thank you, Tony. Uh, welcome everyone. As you said, I'm Nancy Chibri, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you, whether in person or online, to this year's Richard and Louise Guy Lecture Series. Or Louise and Richard. Doesn't matter, <laughs> very important people. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge the land and place where we are hosting today's event. The city of Calgary is located on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 of region, uh, sorry, Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Bagani, and Ghana First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and that the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. And I hope all of you have had the opportunity to go out and enjoy the lovely weather that we're having here in Calgary and all the beautiful fall colors. Every year I keep saying this is the best fall yet. <laughs> and my, my kids uh, like to tease me about that, but it's true. I think this is the best fall yet since I've been here. Before we welcome today's speaker, I want to take a few moments to talk about this incredible lecture series. And as Tony mentioned, as a gift for his 90th birthday, Louise established the Louise and Richard Guy Lecture Series to help share Richard's love of mathematics with a wider audience. In the years since, the, that, since that gift continues to give through unique and inspiring lectures, which Tony has mentioned, were, and yeah, they were fantastic. Um, um, and then lectures delivered by many of the most preeminent mathematicians in the world. To date, about 3,700 people, I estimate it's more, have had an opportunity to hear from these scholars and discover for themselves the joy and wonder of mathematics that Richard so loved to share. And as Tony mentioned, um, this will be the 17th year. Um, and I'm proud to say that I've attended almost every one of these lectures. Uh, and then when I reflected on this, I thought, 17 years? Oh my goodness, if this was a person, they'd be ready, to, they'd be preparing to go off to university next year. And then I thought I was old, and then we, we, went, down, we went down that hill. That was not good. <laughs> but then I thought, well, hopefully they're going off to study math. <laughs> um, on a side and a very personal note, I was very fortunate to have my office across from Richard's in his later years. And often I would just pop in to say, hello, Richard, good morning. Or if I had a math question, I figured Richard will know the answer or he'll find the answer for me. And on one occasion, I popped into his office and we we're just talking. And I said, uh, I mentioned that I was doing this youth outreach in math. 
And before I left, my arms were full of math games and puzzles and posters that he wanted me to share with others. And I think I had to go back to get the second load because he gave me so much stuff. Um, but that was Richard. He was always willing to share his love with math, of math with others, excuse me, and making math more inclusive and most importantly, accessible. Um, both Richard and Louise were very adamant that these lectures be open to the general public. Um, their, goal, their goal for this lecture series was that regardless of a person's math background, expert, um, experts such as Dr. Granville could share their expertise and love of math in a way that, it was, that was accessible. This lecture series is, not, is only part of Richard's legacy, and I want to thank Louise for not only gifting it to Richard, but to all of us here today. Thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you leave tonight inspired or left in awe from Dr. Granville's presentation, because that's exactly what Richard and Louise would have wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So it's uh, my privilege now to introduce this year's uh, speaker, Dr. Andrew Granville. Dr. Granville is a world-renowned expert in number theory, which is one of Richard's uh, lifetime pursuits. So it's very fitting that he is here as our 17th Richard and Louise Guy lecturer. Having trained at Cambridge University in the UK and Queens here in Canada, Dr. Dr. Granville worked at the University of Georgia until he moved to his present position at the Université de Montréal. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an accomplished communicator of mathematical ideas winning the Lester R. Ford Award twice and the Chauvenet Prize for Expository Writing from the Mathematical Association of America. His publications include a graphic novel, Prime Suspects, which uh, was described by a previous guy lecturer, Terry Tao, as one of the most creative ways to present advanced mathematical ideas that I have seen. So, um, so I spoke and Nancy did too, of Richard's passion for sharing mathematics with others, and it's clear that Dr. Granville shares that passion, and today he is going to talk to us on the topic of linear divisibility sequences and other Richard Guy passion projects. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, so I'm, for the people at home, I'm sorry I'm going to move around. Um, you haven't got a moving camera, so uh, where is it pointing the camera here? Okay, you won't see me at all, but I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I wanted this is sort of a personal, I mean, I'm sure with uh, Richard, many people have a personal story about Richard. I'm, I'm sort of going to do things a little differently here. Um, I didn't, I knew Richard, but I didn't know him so well, personally. Oh, this, oh, hello. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you about sort of my relationship with him, which a lot of it he didn't know about, um, but through his work that inspired me. So, um, I did, so he, as many, I'm sure you all know, was a, a major member of the Calgary Al Alpine Club and, I wrote an article in notices recently about Richard's work and with Carl Pomerantz and Chick Scott, who's here, kindly sent me some reminiscences and some uh, photographs, including this wonderful photograph of Richard and Louise, um, a little bit before I ever met either of them. Um, but it's clear that they're having fun out there in the back country. So, um, yeah, so let me start with my own story. I was an uh, undergraduate at Cambridge, as Tony mentioned, a little out of place and not quite knowing what I was doing there. It was the age of Grotendieck type mathematics, and I hated it. Um, and I just didn't enjoy the mathematics. I wanted things a little more basic and a little less structured. And I found these books um, in the bookstore. Okay. I guess I got to point it this way. Nope. Ah, there we go. So here are the two books I found. I think they're um, my original versions. They look very clean, but. Um, yeah, so one was by Richard, Unsolved Problems in Number Theory. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It contains a vast number of problems. And then it was by Dan Shanks, a contemporary, which was a similar sort of title, very, very different in style. So um, 
Dan Chang's book is kind of his view on lots of questions, which some of which are quite alternative, his views. Richard's book is in his own style, which is very, I think the, what I, I would call it is joyful and democratic. So um, you can read about it. There's just problems in little sections that are like half a page long or a page long. And you can read about the problem. And, and so Ben Green was the lecturer here last year. He's a famous statistician, done great work. And some of one of Richard's problems in there, well, famous problem that Richard talked about. And I noticed in the third edition of the book, he had written uh, about Ben Green's work in about four lines. And then he talked about some students who'd done some calculations on something that wasn't quite covered by Ben's theorem. Um, he didn't have detail. And he didn't want to give somebody famous more credit than somebody not famous. He was very democratic. It was about the joy of the question and the things he found fun. And we don't like that in mathematics, typically. We're, we're very focused on the important theorems, the important people. And uh, one of the things that I've always enjoyed about Richard was um, the interest in people. It's a people thing. Which is not, and books, his books are written that way, which is lovely. So, a couple of quotes here. And a shock is he reviewing that first volume, which was in 1981. So, I was a student in, from, uh, I guess I probably picked this up in about 82 or 83 as an undergraduate. Um, um, I'm not sure that's quite true for me, but um, anyway, but it's certainly plausible that people would have their first paper from this book. And one of your colleagues, Hugh Williams, actually, had a nice um, review of Dan Shanks's book. Um, a charming, unconventional, provocative, and fascinating book on elementary number theory, which is about right. Anyway, so for me, these were, were inspiring books. I brought them with me when I moved to Canada. Part of the reason I left Cambridge is it was a pretty joyless place. I mean, people are very serious. I actually did some research in my master's degree, and I remember some professors saying, well, why is that important? For which I, you know... My response was the F word in, in my mind anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I wanted to move somewhere where there was a little, I'm, if I didn't do this as a profession, I wanted to be a people who actually seemed to enjoy it. Um, so I moved to Canada and worked with um, Pally and the Queens. And um, the front of, I think the first conference I ever went to was in California in a cinema, which was uh, a big place for Richard. And um, it was the West Coast Number Theory Conference. And every year, there was, I could only find the 1989 copy. I think I first went in 84 or 85. But um, he would have a list of problems every year. And again, it was very democratic. We'd just have sessions. People would go up and didn't matter if it was a good problem or a stupid problem. It would still be in the list of problems. And he would remark on people's solutions. And um, is everything all right? Oh. Oh, um, Anyway, it was, I, I really enjoyed the meeting. I really enjoyed the spirit of the meeting. Oh, and the only thing there is that everybody gets 10 minutes to talk. It doesn't matter if you're a Phil's medalist or a first-year grad student. Everybody gets 10 minutes. So this was very appealing. So going on a bit, um, there was a advanced study institute, I think in about uh, 88 in uh, Banff. And... Uh, yeah, so I found out that some of these old guys in the profession, well, I think Richard played the piano, right? And, uh, huh? John, none of them played the piano. It's, I haven't remembered Richard playing the piano, but you know how memory is from 35 years ago. Um, I think playing the piano and Selfridge singing. This is John Selfridge over there, who's a friend of, of Richard's, um, and Al van der Porten, who's an Australian, but would turn up to a lot of conferences. Um, but you know, I personally really enjoyed the spirit of, of the conference and Richard um, certainly leading things off. Um, so I guess then he was in his 70s and I was just starting um, off really. But something greatly to be admired. So um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get into some mathematics and I want to get into um, a paper of his, a very typical sort of Richard paper, which was not a great deep thing, but something that was quite provocative. And this was in, uh, oh, it was in mathematics of computation. So it's called primes at a glance. And the idea is you can determine whether something's a prime number at a glance. And here's the example of 349. And why is that a good example? Well, how do you know if the number's prime? It's not divisible by any prime less than its square root, right? So the square root of 349 lies between 17 and 19. 
So if 349 isn't divisible by any prime up to 17, you know it's a prime number. So here's the idea that we wrote 339 as a difference of two numbers. And um, those two numbers contain all the primes less than or equal to 17. So 2 times 5 times 7 times 13 minus 3 times 11 times 17. And therefore, you can deduce that 339 is a prime number. Because it's got... So, so for instance, if you think, could it be divisible by 11? You look at the two terms on the right, and you see 11 divides one of them, but not the other, so it couldn't divide the difference of the two terms. So simple as that. So at a glance, well, if you know how to glance correctly, um, you can observe that this is that 349 is a prime. So what they do in this paper is they 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 look they look at this and then try and determine all of the primes that can be determined by this glancing method. And they do a big calculation and they guess they've found everything because at some point the computer isn't churning anything out. So I so oh yeah, I wrote this down a little more detail down there. So about a few years later, um, when that, after that paper came out, I was talking with uh, Paul Erdosh and uh, Takashi Ago, and um, we were thinking, could you generalize that a bit? And um, so, so the method in primes at a glance only found some primes, and we were wondering whether a modification would allow you to find all primes. Um, but our modification is a bit painful, so we called it a somewhat lengthy glance. Um, and so um, I think maybe did I do another slide? Yeah. So um, well, I'm going to prove that. So instead of doing sum of two things, it's the sum of three things. Um, 29 is 15 plus 20 minus 6. And I want to glance at that and know 29 is a prime. The square root of 29 is bigger than 5 and less than 7. So I just have to check that 2, 3, and 5 don't divide 29, right? So how am I going to do that? Well, with 2, I can see that. 2 divides 20 and 6, but doesn't divide 15. So 2 can't divide the sum of those three numbers, or 15, 20, and minus 6. Similarly, 15 and 6 are divisible by 3, but not 20. So 29 is not divisible by 3, and similarly with 5. And so 29 is prime. It's probably not the most glancy method you've ever come across, but it kind of works and uh, gives you an idea. There's our proof that 61 is a prime. Um, and no, oops, so, sorry. So, in our paper, uh, we prove that every prime can be represented this way. So every prime, there's a way to write it down and glance at it and know it's a prime number. Well, okay, it's fun. It wasn't great mathematics, but we really inspired and, and it was fun project. So I want to talk, oh, I'm losing some of my slides up there, my titles. Can we, is there anything we can do with the, the black bar? Can we move to the bottom of the screen maybe? And be ready to move it more when I tell, tell you. <laughs> People at home are seeing people. Ah. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. yeah. But not here. Okay, now I'm going to remember what I wrote. Okay. So, okay, so, one, so I want to talk about some of Richard's favorite problems. So we're talking about uh, the primes at a glance. But this is really, that was not such a big one. This was a big one in his life. He has at least half a dozen papers on this question, and it's about tiling squares of triangles. So it's an old problem of mathematics, can you tile with different shapes, right, a given object? And um, in this case, I might want to tile the unit square. So I think of, I'm going to work always with the unit square, and I want to tile it with triangles, so that's obviously a tiling, ah, there we go, but we do it with two Triangles, rational sided. So can I tile it with rational sided triangles? Well, this is obviously a fail. Ah, now I can't move this thing. This isn't working. Oh, point it this way. Nope. Ah. What do I do? This isn't working. Maybe if you move one on, it'll start working. Good one. Yes, thank you. Okay, so obviously, um, just by Pythagoras' theorem, the, the diagonal is root two, but if you think about tiling a square of two triangles, if I if I send the line from one corner to anywhere else, I wouldn't be two triangles. So it's got to be on the main diagonal. So there's no way to escape this as a tiling of two triangles. 
and they're not rational sided. So you cannot tile a triangle with um, with um, rational sided, sorry, a unit square of rational sided triangles. So, and I should say, I've written the problem this way, but I could make it integer sides by just scaling up by multiplying through by the common denominator, which I'll, I'll do interchangeably, rational and integer. Um, not to confuse you, but that's just the way things came out. So, um, okay, root two is well known to be irrational, so there's no rational two tiling of a unit square. So, okay, what about three triangles? Can we get three triangles in and tile the unit square? Um, well, if we had a one diagonal in there, it, that would be a length root two, so that isn't going to work, right? If I cut that in two, that line, then the sum being irrational, one of the two is going to be irrational. So we can't have a diagonal if we're going to try and tile the unit square with three rational sided triangles. If we have some sort of corner in the middle, there'll be four triangles. So we can't do that, right? So we can't have something in the middle as a corner. And actually, this is sort of an interesting problem because if, if these were all rational sided, then I'd, I'd have a point here where I'm trying to get to all the corners with rational lengths, which I'll come back to this as a problem later. One of Richard's famous problem, favorite problems. But, okay, now it's the bottom. <laughs> but okay, so this one works. And in fact, it's the only, when you think it through, this is the only tiling you could possibly have um, that you don't immediately see that the rational side, you know, it's feasible you could have a rational sided triangle like this. Rational, sorry, rational sided triangles, three of them that tile the unit square. And the configuration would have to be like this. So let's just kind of give some notation. The lengths of sides are one. So the two, if we have that length T, the first bit, then the other bit would be one minus T, obviously. And then we can use Pythagoras' theorem. And we know that the length of those diagonal uh, pieces, the non-horizontal non vertical ones, are going to be given to Pythagoras' theorem. So we get the square root of one plus T squared and the square root of the other thing. So one way to write it is we need to find a rational number T such that one plus t squared and one plus one minus t squared are both squares of rationals. So by q squared, I mean are the squares of rationals. And if you know your Pythagorean triangles, you can parameterize them in this form um, with a and b coprime. Um, oh, and you can scale that up and down, but that's the basic structure of a parameterization. Um, so the way to get this first one we do t is a squared minus b squared over 2ab. So by the way, my 2ab, I'd get these sides being that, and then this one would be b1. And then there's some third side, um, which is also square because this is a parameterization. So um, the question we have to ask is, now given these a and b, is this also going to be a square? So um, when we write out the uh, value, the formula, we get, remember, we want this to be a rational square. So we get something that's over a square of an integer and some numerator. And that numerator would have to also be a square so that this thing would be a rational square. So just reviewing, we've got this choice of t that's forced on us. It's got to be a parameterization of Pythagorean triangle. And then this other thing, this thing has to be a square of a rational, which means this numerator has to be the square of an integer. Which means, well, if I just divide through by the b to the four, you can see it's homogeneous. So I get a over b to the four, a over b cubed, and all these disappear. So that would actually give me a rational number x with x to the four minus two x cubed plus six x squared plus two x plus one equaling a square. So I would actually get a rational point x y because we also need y to be a rational number on this curve. So somehow I've translated, or Richard translated, um, this geometry problem into asking for a rational point on a curve. And this is a genus one curve. For those who know their stuff in this area, it only says a rational point because I can take x equals zero, y equals one, but x equals zero is an interesting up here. Um, so there may be some rational points that don't give you anything interesting there. But here I can take x equals zero, y equals one. Now, if you have a genus one curve, which has a rational point, it's an elliptic curve. So this can, I'm not going to do it, but this can be transformed into an elliptic curve. And this is the, trans, the elliptic curve it can be transformed into. 
I know you could ask for rational points on elliptic curve. Now, for those who know you, Richard, this was one of his obsessions was elliptic curves and the rational points on elliptic curves. He drew some amazing pictures in his papers, then many beautiful works. And um, this whole project, what he seemed to really enjoy was the translation into elliptic curves and then calculating on the elliptic curves. Well, I should say about these elliptic curves, the, so this is y, v squared equals a cubic, is that if you have a rational point, there may be a few trivial rational points. Like here, I could take u equals 0 and v equals 1. But other than a small number of trivial points that you can find easily, if it has one non-trivial point, it has infinitely many. So the game is, there's sort of an amazing structure in elliptic curves. So the game is, if there's one non-trivial example here, I mean, like t equals 0 is a, well, it wouldn't work, but, but there might be some trivial examples. If there was one non-trivial example, then there would be infinitely many. So that's kind of a charm of this. And they're, they're quite sporadic. You can't parameterize them in an easy way. So they're sort of very interesting mathematics. So, um, yeah, so underneath this banner, it says that actually this is a rank zero elliptic curve. There are no non-trivial points. So this is an easy, this is a way to show that you cannot tie a unit square with three rational sided triangles. That's out. And so now we get to the big game, four triangles. What are the possible configurations? We've got to first do the geometry. And when you do it, there are four configurations. Here they are. And now a very typical Richard guy, this is what they're called. So this looks a bit like a chi. This looks a bit like a delta, capital delta in Greek. This looks very much like a K, so it's a kappa. And this looks like an N, which is kind of the Roman version of nu. And so they got names as configurations. And um, yeah, so he has papers on each of them. Um, and more than one on some. So he was a lot with Andrew Brenner, who's one of his close collaborators. Um, so there are examples where you can tile. This is where you scale up. Um, so he scaled up the um, just multiply through by common denominator. So, um, for instance, on this first one in the delta configuration, we've got a square root of size 360. So, if you want to make one one, you just divide by 360. And then you get these crazy numbers in there. And this is, uh, I've cut and pasted from Richard's paper, from photograph of Richard's paper. You can see he had nice handwriting. He loved to draw pictures. Um, I see he actually, towards the end, as I've started using picture drawing software, but I much preferred it when he didn't. I liked some of you could use their ruler and compass way better than I could ever imagine. Um, anyway, so um, these are three examples. He doesn't give an example in the uh, um, I configuration case, but we'll get back to that. So the new configuration he gave here was this one. Um, and what you see is there's a symmetry that um, this is 25, this is 25, this is 26. So there is a rotational symmetry. And actually, that leads to an elliptic curve. If you try and parameterize that using that, you're know, the all Pythagorean triples. I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but it's kind of nice to see some of the ideas that went in. So let's just check that. So, so let me go back. So that's the, his thing. I'm going to put a line in, um, not very beautifully. And my point is, I put a perpendicular bisector down here. And so this is of length seven here, right? Then this whole bit is of length uh, 17. So the bit that remains is of length 10. Yeah. So basically, and I can do the same on the other side. So there's essentially two Pythagorean triangles in here the 7, 24, 25 Pythagorean triangle, if you remember your Pythagorean triangles. And this one's 10, 24, 26, which is a scaled up version of 5, 12, 13. Yeah, it's just twice the 5, 12, 13. So it's a bit simple to make that work, but can you generalize that is the obvious question. Um, again, there's, there's words under there that I just said. Um, so let's just look at delta configuration. What are the equations that you need to play with to make this all work? So here's the delta configuration. And really, we're just starting with um, we get our unit square, I'll use Cartesian coordinates, we start with 0, 0. The thing at the top there is at height 1, so it's some number A, rational number A, 1, comma 1. Over here, it's 1, comma some rational number B. 
I am looking at the only rationals, and I want all of those diagonals to be squares of rational, or to be rational numbers, which means that the uh, lengths of those vectors that define those sides, they all have to be um, squares of rationals, a squared plus one, b squared plus one, and then the tricky one going from a1 to 1b, the distances are a minus 1 and 1 minus b. So those all have to be squares. And let me just use a little bit of notation. So we're going to have a set that gives you um, the set of, of rational numbers a, such that a squared plus 1 is a square, which we're using a lot here. And uh, so, for instance, 3 over 4 or 4 over 3 work, right? Because I had 3 over 4, I could just multiply 3 by um, 4. And I'd see three squared plus four squared, which we know is five squared. Dividing out that four, I get three over four squared plus one is five over four all squared. So that works quite easily. Um, so just a familiar numbers from Pythagorean triples. And um, what we actually want is that if we've got two numbers A and B in the set, then we want a third number to be in that set. And I'm going to have to ask you to move this because I put all these equations at the bottom. It's annoying. I've had this problem before of not being able to handle the Bar. Um, okay, so okay, leave it on. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you. So what we find is that um, for each given n, um, this is equivalent to finding rational points again on a curve of genus one, which you can show is. Uh, got a rational point, you can probably identify the rational point there, so it's an elliptic curve, and then you've got other family of elliptic curves to play with, and this is what Richard and Andrew have a couple of papers on really understanding this family of elliptic curves. Um, yeah, yeah, well done. So the Kappa configuration, we just do a very similar thing. Um, we get something similar. Um, I didn't work out all the details, but it looks something like um, you need A, B, and C in that set S, where A plus B times C is A plus C. Um, and then the new configuration, which is kind of the prettiest, because what we'll do is we'll say that the first length going across is A, the second length going across is B, and the third length going across is C. So A plus B plus C equals 1. And if each of those uh, diagonals are square are, are rational, then a squared plus one, b squared plus one, c squared plus one are squares. And so in the notation I introduced in a couple of slides ago, we need three elements, a, b, c, and s, such that their sum is one. And then the this particular example where it's symmetric, this last length is the same as the first length, so that'll be a equals c. So in general, uh, here's a general solution, again, an elliptic curve. And in the symmetric case, you get this elliptic curve. So um, we already know there's a non-trivial point on this elliptic curve from this example, and that gives us infinitely many points, which you can then just write out for fun. So, um, yeah, so this was one of his obsessions, and uh, I kind of enjoy it, a little geometry. Um, the one that's unsolved is this point somewhere in the middle, the, the chi configuration, and uh, these are the four equations that need doing. And that's the same as this really weird equation for elements of the set. Nobody knows how to do it. And this is an open problem, the so-called four distancing problems, distance problem. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of work on that. You'll find in his unsolved problems in geometry and number theory, lots of talk on this problem. Um, of course, the three rational distance problem is solved from the Kappa configuration. Um, anyway, nobody has any idea whether this is doable. And it's one of his obsessions. Okay, so I'm going on to, um, I don't know what time you want me to end, but at, at six? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so let me go on to a different subject, and that's linear division sequences. And um, my little story is that um, my opponents um, and myself, and in fact, um, Ron Graham were asked to write this commemorative article on Richard for the Notes of the American Mathematical Society. Unfortunately, Ron died in the middle of us not writing it very fast. Um, so I was left to call him myself. And um, I made the decision that I thought, you know, I always like this problem. So um, is there a problem? No. Um, I always like Richard's problem. So I'd take the opportunity to go and just try and 
blast through all his papers and see if there are any ones that particularly appeal to write about. And um, there was this one that I'm going to tell you about that he obsessed on. Uh, he has quite a few articles on. And I'll tell you about one of his results that I found very inspiring. And um, I spent four months then trying to resolve the problem that he was obsessed by, and I did resolve it, but not without some blood, sweat, tears, and toil. So um, let me tell you a little bit about that. So um, Fibonacci numbers, I hope you all know, it's a linear recurrent sequence because you define the next term in the sequence by some sum of previous terms, maybe with coefficients. Um, and these are the first few Fibonacci numbers. Um, and it has a very strange property that you may or may not know that the, the nth term always divides the nth term. So maybe we'll take an example here. Um, let's see, 13. This is a zero term, first term, second term, third term, fourth term. Seventh term is 13, okay? So I claim it divides the 14th term. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Does 13 divide 377? Guy who told us 1329s. Come on, that's easy. So... Um, let's try the next one. Does 21 divide 987? Let's see. That's 37 uh, times. So, yeah, at least in two examples, this, this observation works. And in fact, it's not that hard. I'll show you in a minute how to prove that Fm divides um, Fn whenever m divides n. Um, so there are two, two properties of interest to us. Um, this is called the, any, any sequence that has this property is a division sequence. You don't have to have a linear occurrence to Ask does Fm divide Fn whenever m divides n? Um, we put the two together, and that's called a linear division sequence. It satisfies the linear occurrence, and it has this divisibility property. And um, well, I think I've gone, I've forgotten exactly what I put on the slides, but the very first journal to be published in North America, the very first issue, the American Journal of Mathematics. 1875, published at John Hopkins University. In that very first issue was some very long papers. Um, Sylvester had quite a lot in there, and uh, Edward Luca had about 80 papers in three chunks on divisions on recurrence sequences. And people like to credit this problem to um, him, though it's not entirely true, but he did note, note at least this and thought it was cool and worth mentioning. So. Kind of fun, this problem goes back to the very first American publication in mathematics. So I called the 1875 question, can we determine all the linear division sequences? And that's completely anachronistic. That question wasn't asked for another 60 years, but, but the root of the question was back there. Um, so can we determine all sequences that are both linear sequences of integers, linear current sequences, and have the divisibility property? I'll call them all the S's sometimes. And we also actually have even more. Not only does Fm divide Fn whenever m divides n, if you take the GCD of two elements of the Fibonacci sequence, then you get F of the GCD. And that's a strong linear division sequence. So supplementarily, you can ask, uh, can we find all those? Which seems to be asking a lot of a sequence. So another example of linear division sequence is 2 to the n minus 1. And this has the property that... Um, Similar property that that it's a divisibility sequence, like because x to the n minus one divides x to the n minus one, wherever m divides n. Um, and actually, you can easily see it's a uh, recurrent sequence because here's a linear recurrence. I'll explain a little bit more about where this linear recurrence comes from in a bit. Um, so it's also a linear division sequence. There's also what we call Lucas sequences. Um, so you can take any alpha and beta, um, or they can be in integers, or they can be quadratic conjugates. So if you want to introduce, I can take two to the n minus one minus alpha equals two and beta equals one. That gives me the Mersenne numbers. Or the Fibonacci, oh, that shouldn't be minus five, that should be plus five, but um, the Fibonacci numbers are given by that. Oh, I wrote that down there. Okay, so why does this always work with Luca sequences? And you have this property that, that we're writing the sequences, one polynomial or another, where they're both examples, they're both substitutions into a basic polynomial. And we use the fact that x to the n minus y to the n always divides x to the n minus y to the n when m divides n, which is a simple algebra observation. And in fact, here is the linear division, here is the linear recurrence you satisfy. 
um, if, if you're interested in these sorts of things, it's the, the variable is like the x to the n and the y to the n. I mean, it's divided by a constant there. And so um, it's sort of x and y are the roots that are important. These are the things that are growing. And you can see they come into this uh, situation. So we have a notion of polynomial linear division sequences. So I'll give you a few less interesting examples. A constant times a to the n is a linear division sequence. And um, what I need to do now is associate a polynomial to the coefficients. So 1 times x to the n plus 1. If I put that ax of, AX of n on the other side, there'll be a minus a. Uh, oh, sorry. Here's another one. n squared satisfies a linear occurrence. It's also obviously a divisibility sequence. m squared divides n squared if m divides n. Um, and if I put those minus 3 plus 3, 1 on the other side, you clearly get the coefficients of x minus 1 cubed. And in fact, any degree d polynomial satisfies the binomial coefficient recurrence. That's what I call this of the order d plus 1. So here, d equals 2. And actually, it turns out that you can multiply together any 2D linear division sequence and get another one. And let me just show you here, I've taken the product of the Fibonacci numbers and the Mason numbers. And here is the linear occurrence they satisfy. And you're like, huh, so what? I mean, where, where does that come from? And actually, there is a simple reason. So the Fibonacci numbers, I put them on better, it was better, on all, all on the one side here, right? So Fn plus two is Fn plus one minus plus Fn, but it's better to write on one side. And then you see the coefficients, one minus one minus one. So the, the corresponding polynomial, which is called the characteristic polynomial, is x squared minus x plus minus one. For the Mersenne numbers, it's x squared minus three x plus two. By the way, you can see here the roots are x, that factor is x minus one, x minus two. So it's got roots two and one, which correspond to these numbers, two to the n minus one to the n. And then when I multiply them together, I just multiply together these two characteristic polynomials. So this isn't hard to prove. I have proved it on the next slide, but I don't think I'm going to go through it in the interest of time or proof. Um, but anyway, there is a recipe for multiplying together linear division sequences and getting new, new ones. This is it, basically. Um, so, um, okay, so I've just given you more information here. If you have a linear occurrence satisfying something like that with integer coefficients, you can form the polynomial by pushing everything on one side. That's going to look like a product of roots. Obviously, you factor it. And then the linear occurrence can be written as um, sum of alpha i to the ends over these roots times polynomials in n where the degree of a polynomial corresponds to the power of the root. So, I mean, I did this in high school, um, but unfortunately, linear occurrences got carried out of high school curriculum in very long time, in the last millennium, I think, in most of the world, sadly. Um, so some of you know as well, some of you probably don't. Um, okay, so this is a proof, forget the proof, it's easy enough, it's just you substitute in and it works. Um, but anyway, so trust me that this is a way to represent um, the uh, terms in linear occurrence, given the linear occurrence, and you can factor the characteristic polynomial. So let me tell you a little bit of the history of this problem. So 1875 was this paper by Edward Luca. Um, and then 1936, Marshall Hall, um, who was a prominent mathematician at the time, tried to classify the third order linear division sequences. That's when, um, so Fibonacci is like second order because Fn plus two is Fn plus one plus Fn, a third order one, and these are easy to classify, the second order ones. The third order ones is where it starts to get challenging. So when F, you know, un plus three is a function of un plus two, un plus one, and un. So this brings up general problem. He mentions that his question's kind of around in earlier risks. Um, and, uh, well, I don't know why I went on about history. So, well, not so recent book on, on the general subject of linear current sequences, which calls this problem very old. So sometimes it's hard to identify exactly where something comes from. Um, a few, I don't know, I've maybe gone into too much detail here, but a few easy observations is if you have a linear division sequence, you can always divide out by the first term because it divides everything. But that would make the first term one. So you can assume without rest of generality to the first term's one. Um, if the zeroth term is non-zero, then every un divides u zero because every n divides zero. That only gives you finitely many possibilities for un and also for any vector. So it quickly shows you it's periodic. 
it's going to be hard if you're not kind of familiar with these sort of ideas to understand the proofs I'm giving, but just try and follow the statement. So it's not very interesting when u0 is not zero. So we can see the first, there's u0, zero, zero, and u1 is one. It's like kind of a standard hypothesis. And the guess that Marshall Hall made was that perhaps every linear division sequence is the product of these trivial constant n to the d's, something periodic, and these Lucas sequences. And the problem with conjecture like this is how do you get your hands on things to find this out? So um, I want to tell you about work of Richard when he was 95 years old with Hugh Williams here in Calgary, um, which I found very inspiring. And of course, with Richard, it came out of playing games, and he gave a crazy example that really required some thinking. And his example suggested that Marshall Hall couldn't be more wrong. So I want to tell you about this. So I'm going to start with some easier sequences. So I'm going to count. So two by one dominoes, you know, a domino is you've got kind of a little piece and it's cut in two, right? And what you want to do is kind of tile a rectangle with that. So, you know, I did some tiling earlier on with triangles and squares. So just think about it. So I'm going to start my two by n rectangle and I'm going to to um, place two by one dominoes in it. So if I've got a two by one rectangle, well, that's pretty obvious. There's only one way to do it. Two by two, there's two ways to do it, right? You can do it. Yeah, well, you can see what I mean. So let's just have a look at um, how you might attack this. So if I want to look at the way of doing a two by one rectangle, I'll start at the left hand end, and there's two ways I can do the dominoes right in the left hand end. I could put one vertically down, right? And then the rest is as if I was doing tiling a two by n minus one, right? So that's one way I could start. And the other way I could start is putting one horizontally. But the only way I could occupy that square is putting its twin next to it horizontally. So once I've done that, I've blocked off the first two rows, two columns. But everything else is as if I've just got a tile n minus two spaces, yeah? So, I've got that the number of ways to tile a two by n rectangle is equal to the number of ways to, to tile an n two by n minus one rectangle plus the number of ways to tile a two by n minus two. Oh, and we've got Fibonacci numbers again. How cool is that? So let's look at two by one and a three by n rectangle. Well, of course, the number of squares occupied is going to be even. Right? So I need to make the number of squares in this rectangle even. That's why I've done 2n. Um, and then should be a similar argument. You can get some linear current sequence satisfied by the number of rows, and it's related to Lucas sequences, whatever. Doesn't matter. That's not the interesting one. The interesting one is 4 by n. Who'd have thought it? Why 4 by n? But it is. So what Richard and Hugh looked at was the number of rows to place 2 by 1 dominoes in a 4 by n minus 1 rectangle. And what they were able to show was that that ON satisfies this linear occurrence. Well, so what? I mean, it's just some linear occurrence. Um, but I want to tell you about a representation of a number AN. So here's what they observed, is that you can factor the characteristic polynomial as a product of two conjugate bits. So it's got a strange factorization. And... If I factor these two conjugate bits, x minus alpha, x minus beta, as x minus delta, or x minus beta, x minus gamma, then a n actually looks like that. That's actually the formula. So you know, we sort of look at sequence alpha to the n minus beta, n over alpha minus beta for a second order linear occurrence. This is a fourth order linear occurrence. And this particular family of fourth order linear occurrences, this is the general form. And, um, in this particular case, these guys studied it, and uh, this didn't seem to be in this. I said with, there were several forms that Hall said it come from a product of these forms, particularly Lucas sequences, and they could more or less show that this doesn't work. In fact, that you need to work with big generalizations of Lucas sequences with instead of one thing to the n minus one thing to the end, it's two things to the end, it's two other things to the end. Although they come from some weird, so they showed there were similar examples of any family that kind of factors this way. It didn't have to be this particular linear occurrence. So that kind of screwed up the whole whole conjecture thing and uh, put the cat amongst the pigeons. And this is what I got a bit obsessed by when I read it. I'm like, 
I don't really believe it, except everything they said was true. So let's try and understand it. And I came up for a reason, and this is the crazy reason. Is, and, and at first sight, we're going to say, um, if you're a mathematician, we might be missing a point here, but I could write it as a product of two Lucas sequences. I'm dividing it by something. I'm dividing it by alpha to the n minus one. And then, okay, so the thought might be you can sort of divide out part of that alpha to the n from here, part of it from here, and maybe you can get a product of two Lucas sequences. I'm going to explain to you why that's impossible. So why, although they missed this, there was a good reason they missed that. There is a factorization a bit like Lucas sequences. And if you're, if you're a mathematician, then the key reason is that alpha and beta, the GCD of these two objects and the GCD of these two objects in their example are both non-principal ideals. And so you can't just divide out by non-principal ideals. So um, let me look at this um, in a more general context. And the more general context I'm going to tell you about is reduced fractions. So we're not very used to reduce fractions. You can take three over six, and that's a fraction, but it's but you reduce it to one over two because you can divide out by the GCD of three and six, right? And now you may not have thought of this, but what can you do in a number field? What can you do saying Q root minus five? So I've got some expression in so A plus B root minus five, where A and B are integers over C plus D root minus five. Is there a canonical reduced fraction? Is there a way to reduce everything? Because there is, you know, in the integers, we all know it, right? We learned it in primary school. And here's an example I want to try. One plus root minus five over three. And that's a carefully chosen example because it's, for those who know their algebra, the ideal generated by these two things is a non-principal prime ideal. Well, um, I don't, for those who don't know their algebra, all I can say is that, that you have, to, in, in number fields sometimes, you can't just work with the numbers themselves. You have to sort of work with a collection of numbers called an ideal. And um, this is sort of, this is completely standard in, in a first course in algebra, but um, you can't write this just these, these numbers just as a multiple of one thing. So what am I trying to say? If I take the GCD of uh, I don't know six and nine um, in the integers, then the sophisticated way to think of it is all linear combinations of six and nine. And it turns out all linear combinations of six and nine is the same thing as all multiples of three. You can always reduce it to, the, in the integers, the multiples of one number. But you can't do that in every field. For instance, Q minus five. And now, this turns out to be a problem because our algorithm for these fractions is take the numerator and denominator, divide out by the GCD, and you're done. But this isn't going to work there. And in fact, when you try, the best you can do is change it to another thing that is annoying. And so what's interesting is that those are equal. You can check it because three times two is six, and one minus uh, one squared minus root minus five squared is one minus minus five is six. And if you look at the prime ideal, the the, the ideal of the GCD of these two, it's not one either. The GCD here is also a non-principal ideal, prime ideal, which divides two, and the one over there divides three. So um, it's a big real mess to reduce fractions and number fields. I mean, there's more that can be said, but I don't want to say it. I just want to say that up here, the algorithm that's around us is to divide through by the GCD of alpha and beta, and we can't do this because of the reduced fraction problem. Um, and so, I mean, I've heard this many times in theory in algebra courses, in algebraic number theory courses, in algebra courses, but I've never seen in practice where it's really been a pain in the neck like this. So, um, just using my, my numbers instead of Rich and Hughes, we get to this formula, and there's no real way to reduce it any further. You always have to divide out by this three to the n minus one. There's no, nothing you can do. So you need to adjust horse conjecture to take into account the value through my integer powers like this. So I thought once I'd figured out what Hugh and Rich had done, I was done. This is all gonna fall into place now, but it didn't, um, which is rather frustrating. Um, let me not worry too much. Don't need to worry about this. So um, I think I've got five minutes left. So um, so let me just say that, okay, so we said that when you multiply two linear current sequences together, you get another linear current sequence. And there's a very interesting uh, theorem called the Hadamard quotient theorem 
that if you have, if you're given two linear occurrences, A and B, and the quotient is always an integer, then the quotient actually is a linear occurrence sequence. This is a very famous conjecture that was proved uh, back in the 80s. In fact, I think it was announced at, that, at Banff, this theorem. Um, and, um, okay, so you can multiply and divide linear occurrence sequences with sensible meanings to those. But what's going to be interesting to us is can you take GCDs and LCMs? Um, and the question is, are they, oops, are they linear occurrence sequences? And in fact, by the hand, because when you take the GCD of two numbers and multiply it by the LCM, you get the product of the two numbers. If one of them is linear occurrence and the other one is by Hadamard quotient theorem, so we'll just work with one of them. And as an example, I'll take my favorite sequences. Are the Mersenne number, number, the GCD of Mersenne numbers and the Fibonacci numbers, is that a linear occurrence? And okay, I was going to go into this at some length, but I won't. But the answer is no. You can prove using some Diophantine approximation, whatever that is, and a little bit of elementary number theory and a bit of analytic number theory. That um, that's, that's the best proof I've got. Maybe someone come up with a clever one. Um, that in fact the the GCD of the Mersenne numbers and the Fibonacci numbers. There's no linear current sequence, so that's completely irrelevant to everything I'm talking about, except I want to show you an amazing example that occurred quite recently. And in fact, Hugh Williams was telling me that him and Richard got obsessed by this paper. They never published anything on it, but, but they're very fascinated by this, this guy's observation. So he found a new linear division sequence that absolutely fails false conjecture. Um, so... Um, and it was just the Luca numbers, Luca, not, is it Luca sequence, which is if the Fibonacci numbers is alpha to the n minus beta n over alpha minus beta, then this is the so called companion sequence, alpha to the n plus beta to the n. You can get that from, I think, f to n divided by f n. But anyway, he said take the product of these two. And the question is, is this in any way obviously um, a linear division sequence? Well, it's certainly not the product of Luca sequences. So. It really, it's quite easy to show it can't be what Hall conjectured. And what I want to show you is why is it a linear division sequence? Well, given that I've showed you that it looks like alpha n plus beta n and this thing, you can write it as in that same structure as we saw before, where this is the polynomial. And so what I'm going to tell you is that this polynomial gives you a linear division sequence. So the question in your mind should be, if I substitute x to the k and y to the k in here, this should divide x to the a plus y to the k and x to the 3k minus y to the 3k. And I think that's very unobvious at first sight. But the right observation is that the number way to describe this is least common multiples. So I'm sorry, I'm telling you a very a complicated story very fast. But the, the interesting point here was that the LCM of sequences and the integers don't, of linear recurrent sequences and the integers don't give you linear recurrent sequences and the integers. But the LCM of linear recurrent sequences and polynomials will give you new linear recurrent sequences in the polynomials. It's kind of crazy. So you can work with these instead. Okay, well, that's probably enough. But once we take into account Gambian's examples, generalizations, and our understanding of it, take into account this new construction of using LCMs in, in function fields and translating that to number fields that Rich and Hugh are interested in, a few other details that really don't want to hear about, we get a complete classification. Hooray! So <laughs> that was four months of my life. Um, so um, this is what Richard was like. He'd be sitting there, you'd sort of in your consciousness, there's a small dot of a brown field where Richard has planted himself. It gets a little bigger, that brown dot in your consciousness. You want to know more about it. Maybe more. It looks fairly barren. It looks like some scary slopes behind him. And then it's getting a little less barren. And then we're in a green lush pasture. Suddenly the ideas are clear. Um, there's still a lot of scary slopes behind him, but um, that's the beauty of good problems. Okay, thank you. Mm. 
Well, this is going to be good. Well, thank you, Andrew, for a really intriguing trip through uh, some very interesting problems. I, it reminds me of talking to Richard because they would, they would start off with some very simple observations, and, and then all of a sudden I'd feel terribly lost because we <laughs> would uh, zip off with some, like I did at the beginning with factorizations of numbers that, that you know, uh, I guess, but uh, it just had to have a little background from things, and he'd show them just, just, uh, just like that. It was, but it's really, really fascinating. You know, we have an opportunity for people online to ask questions. Uh, if you're online, you have a question that you want to ask, could you put it, type it into the Q and A box. I guess I'm going to have to put my glasses on to read questions. I don't see any at the moment, and it, there were, there was the opportunity for questions from people in the audience. So maybe we'll entertain something from the audience first while we're waiting for the typing to happen. Yeah, don't feel shy. Go, go ahead, Ethan. Here. Here. Okay. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned quickly come up at a glance deep observations in some publications. If there, I understand that you couldn't be too efficient, but this is something you explored, like... It was 25 years ago, or more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I, I vaguely remember talking to Odosh and, and Takashi about this. Um, I can't tell you how our, our thoughts progressed. I'm sorry, I wish I could. You'll find at some point you know, some things blur together. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. You need to talk in that. I need to just put it back. And then I pass this back. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Ethan, I think you have. Oh, there's somebody behind. I'm, I, I don't see who it is. That's... I was wondering, what was the, the feeling on the, the, the Chi conjecture for their uh, So, what was the feeling on the Chi conjecture? The triangle, Kappa, and Mu, but the, the open one was the pie. Is that is that believed that there should be a construction or I don't think that's a question. But here's book unsolved problems in geometry known as UPIG, um, which from the initials. And um yeah, they they um there are these questions which are outside of a curve realm. So I guess the most famous is the rational box problem which is sort of similar flavor problem where you want a box where all the sides are rationals and all the diagonals, including the main diagonal rationals. And if you remove one condition, we can solve it. And usually because of some curve, it can be parameterized in terms of a curve. But as soon as you put all the conditions together, it's probably a surface that you really need to understand. So one more variable. A curve is like a curve when you draw it. And a surface is one dimensional more. And the tools we have for understanding arithmetic on, on surfaces are relatively weak. So there are a bunch of intriguing problems that boil down to points on surfaces. I, I suspect this one does too. And um, we find ourselves at a bit of a loss of what to do. So you can find a lot of papers where they uh, recast the problem in different light, but no light has yet been strong enough to shine an answer. So, uh, yeah. So I wanted to actually say something with what Robert said about um, intimidation. Um, so Richard actually was was one to get intimidated. Um, he, um, I, many, some of you, but maybe not all of you know, his personal history was he had done his, I think his master's degree um, at Cambridge and then 
um, Second World War came along and he had some teaching and then he worked in meteorology. But anyway, the point is he never got his PhD and he went off and he taught mathematics in different countries in the world for ending up here in Calgary, I think in the late 60s. And uh, he never got a PhD until he retired. Um, so he, uh, you know, he had he had splendid, you know, amazing enthusiasm. He had questions he loved. Um, he was, you know, many he, of the great instigators of mathematics, like Paul Paul Odosh and uh, and others, um, John Conway and others. He was kind of good friends with them and would take their problems and and tell the world about them, draw some great pictures, draw some great analogies. Um, but he always he would sometimes just be like. Um, I'd be explaining something to him that I'd thought about one of his questions and and I would lose him. And he would he would say, you know, I'm an amateur mathematician. <laughs> yeah. But you know, he was sort of an amateur that was obviously extraordinary and better than most professional mathematicians, but it was his go-to place. And on those moments he felt a little awkward. It was kind of cute. You certainly don't expect it from a 70-year-old, very established and esteemed mathematician. <laughs> Tony, so the, the, the domino example prompts a question about how, what happens if you're allowed other figures, other polynomials. I, I have to admit that um, I suspect there are such things, and uh, maybe we should look at uh, winning ways for your mathematical plays or one of Richard's other books. So, so um, he certainly explored polyment, uh, poly. I made you do it. <laughs> Do you, you've worked on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I should be able to. Say yeah. That. Um, right. So, 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 can you answer that question? No. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, look. I mean, Richard was interested in natural sequences that have beautiful mathematics in it. He he explored them. He generalized them. He found them. He opened them up. Um, do I know every example? He didn't know, um, but certainly there have been several that that I found fun to to explore further. Richard used to be famous for running to talks by famous mathematicians and sitting usually fairly out of the front so he could be seen or he could see, but he spent he often spent most of the time writing in in, in this beautiful minuscule script uh, sequences that are regenerated, which produce these produce the intuition for many of the examples and conjectures that she, which he found. And he used to tell us all that it's, it doesn't matter if you do that sort of thing because some things are going to be entering your subconscious from the speaker, and sometime later you're going to have some ideas that come out. I mean, it was it was a, a great privilege to know him for that. And I also wanted to mention that he used to uh, go out for one night uh, when we had. Uh, junior and senior high school students coming and and uh, he would delight in discussing the problems that the, the students were looking at and uh, helping uh, helping out with the uh, with with the solutions. Sometimes it, trying to lead them through something like developing you know a solution for general cubics. Uh, you know, as if this was something that should naturally and easily happen to uh, with uh, grade seven students and things like that. But it it was always very fascinating to to work with them. Are there any other questions? Any online? No. Well, uh, if if not, I'd like to thank Andrew again for a, a very inspiring talk. I hope it all. All of us will go off and generate a sequence or two and uh, and do some things. I'd also like to mention somebody who's in the audience, who's Stephanie, uh, who is a, a representative for the for the uh, alumni association, and would like to connect with 
alumni who may be here and uh, have have uh, learned about what their thoughts and interests are. So as, as this is uh, associated with the alumni uh, group as well, uh, it, it, it certainly fits the spirit of the Richard and Louise Guy uh, series. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming out and I hope you have a pleasant rest of the evening.